Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Preeti Shirodkar, Associate Professor, MIT Institute of Management. I would be discussing issues of integration in host lands in the context of USA and Canada. Let us begin with a couple of interesting facts. We all know that both in the US and Canada, most people are outsiders. There is a very minuscule population that is native. And yet, everybody is not treated equally. Why is that so? Another interesting fact that is worth noting is that Canada is a more generous welfare state than the US. And yet, people are more interested in going to the US rather than Canada. Again, what could be the reason for this? It is possibly time to find out answers to this, which we would try and do through this module. Let us begin by setting the context. Integration takes various forms, assimilation, acculturation, and multiculturalism or pluralism. What is assimilation? Assimilation refers to sharing a common culture with equal opportunities. Acculturation, on the other hand, involves a change in both the groups, the people who have migrated and the native population of the place to which they have migrated. Acculturation is thus largely dependent on the policies of the host country. What then is multiculturalism or pluralism? This aims at maintaining the status quo. All groups are expected to melt into the mainstream. What then is the difference in the integration policies of the US and Canada? US is defined as a melting pot culture, where every individual identity is supposed to be lost to produce a new identity. That new identity is supposed to be the American identity. Canada, on the other hand, has multiculturalism which involves the coexistence of varied cultures without one culture dominating the other. Thus, the essential principles and policies of integration in the US and Canada are very different. It is therefore important to look at both of them in detail. I will begin by talking about the integration of immigrants into Canada. Among the Indian immigrants into Canada, the first were the Sikhs who were stationed in British regiments in Canada and travelled through Vancouver. They brought back stories of the greatness of Canada, the lovely weather, the richness of life, the plentiful availability of various resources. What they did not, however, speak about and possibly wouldn't have known were the discriminatory rules these discriminatory rules involved a violation of the rule of continuous journey. Canada had come up with the rule of continuous journey. This meant that people who were coming without continually traveling from their native land were not going to be allowed into Canada. However, on 23rd May 1914, Sikhs other than 20 Sikhs who had a resident status were not allowed to disembark from Komata Garu. This resulted in a lot of issues for the Sikhs who had arrived with great expectations to Canada. The second area was Canada's severely restrictive policies against immigrants from India and non-whites. The third was the Chinese Immigration Act of 1885. In this act, the head tax was increased from $100 per person to $500 per person, suddenly making immigration very expensive. Finally, there were the anti-Oriental riots of 1907, which shook the foundations that people believed in Canada as a dreamland. However, things changed because the laws changed after the Second World War and due to the newly formed government pressure. As a result of this, Canadians were now allowed to bring both their wives and children 
unlike earlier when they had to come alone and leave their families behind. They were also allowed to vote after 1947. In the 50s and 60s, therefore, a large number of professional and managerial immigrants went to Canada. And therefore, the flow of immigrants increased from the early 20th century. How then did the Indian diaspora began integrating into the economic sector? The liberalization of the Canada government's immigration policy in the 1960s was furthered by Pierre Trudeau's liberal government. There was a white paper on immigration in 1966. This was followed by the Green Paper on Immigration in 1975. The Green Paper on Immigration allowed for family reunion and opened up avenues for the refugee classes. The third interesting development was the Employment Equity Act of 1986. This aimed at equality in the workplace and rules were put in place to avoid racism making it more comfortable for people to want to come and settle in Canada. This led to large number of people moving to Canadian universities, both to study and work, especially in the fields of mathematics, engineering and the applied sciences. Furthermore, Chris Alexander in 2014 came up with the Can Plus program this program offered an efficient visa system where within six months the papers of people who were desirous of moving to Canada were processed. This further facilitated people's desires of moving into Canada. After comfort with integrating into the economic sector, there was also an integration into the religious, social and cultural life of the Indian diaspora. We have thought of earlier that pluralism was what defined the Canadian thought. This pluralism was seen in the religious, social and cultural life. Diverse Indian places of worship were allowed to be set up and this helped in fostering the teachings of religious beliefs to the second generation of diasporics who are now in Canada. Furthermore, there was a great deal of availability of dance, film and literature, both by the native population living in Canada who had immigrated there or by people who were back home. After this, there was also a great deal of celebration of Indian festivals, which brought about a sense of camaraderie and a connection with people back home. Moreover, in Canada, there was respect given to the traditional medicines and dietary customs of the immigrants. All this led to a sense of comfort with the pluralism in the religious, social and cultural life of Canada. This was enhanced then with the first Indian Diaspora Festival which took place on 15th August 2014. However, this is not to say that there weren't any challenges. The three primary challenges were one, the glass ceiling phenomenon, which was that there was a great resistance to immigrants moving upwards in their jobs. The second, there was a need felt to learn Canada's other official language, which was French, which was not easy for all immigrants to do. And third, there were cases of racism, seen both in the employment market as also the way in which class and gender politics played out. Now, let us look at the integration of the Indian immigrants into the US. US is home to one of the largest Indian diasporic population. This immigrant population has moved to the US in two phases, one being the pre-65 phase and the other being the post-65 phase. Both have been marked by a differentiation in policy and law. To understand this, we need to look at the history of the US immigration policy. In 1924 and 1952, legislations were put in place to define whom to allow or restrict into the US. In 1921, the Quota Selection Act restricted the flow 
to 350,000 immigrants based on a screening process. This was followed by the Immigration Policy Act of 1924, further restricting the number to 150,000 a year. However, the World War made US seem a less hostile place to reside in, given its power. Furthermore, in 1952, the Macron-Walter Act was put in place. It was also known as the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952. It allotted 100 visas annually to Asians of the US. In 1965, many immigrant quotas were eliminated. The Immigrant Act of 1965, however, showed a preference to entry of skilled laborers into the US. This resulted in the Silicon Valley immigrants, which we all know about and whose success is legendary. Green card issuance, family-sponsored immigration, employment-based immigration, immediate relatives of citizens were policies that were put in place, facilitating the movement of people to the US. Furthermore, there were varied favorable policies created for integration. Indians constitute the third largest Asian diaspora in the US after the Chinese and the Filipinos. Post-independence in 1947, a large number of skilled laborers migrated to the US. This was the result of the 1965 Immigration and Naturalization Act. On the other hand, students from India also account for a large number of people in the US. It accounts for 13% of the international students in the US, according to the Institute of International Education. This strength of Indian population is second only to China in the context of immigrants. American Indians have increased by almost 184% and have crossed 1.71 million according to official data, which shows the popularity of US as a destination for diasporics. India is considered the second largest country of origin among new lawful permanent residents. These have gained green cards through employment pathways and not family sponsorships or preferences. On the other hand, there have also been 2,84,000 unauthorized Indian immigrants between 2009 and 2013, of whom about 11,000 have been approved under the DACA initiative. DACA referring to Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. In the US, Indian immigrants have been provided with home ownership facilities as also health insurance coverage, ensuring qualitative and good standard of living. Between May 1998 and June 1999, of the 1,34,000 new H-1B visas issued to highly skilled foreigners, for a period of six years, 63,900 were issued to Indians. Moreover, Indian students are known to get 5 to 10 percent of the major awards announced in the US. Indians are thus looked upon as model minorities. This makes US an attractive destination. On the other hand, this is not to deny that working in lower middle class, as also those with family reunion visas, have also entered the US during this period. Let us now look at the religious faith and challenges of assimilating in the mainstream US. US is one of the most diversely religious nations, yet Indian immigrants face challenges in expressing their religious faith. This is, however, not to say that no attempts have been made. In 1894, Swami Vivekanand established the Vedanta Society with a branch opening in 1900. In 1912, the renowned Sufi teacher Hazrat Inayat Khan made his way to the US. This was followed by the establishment of a Gurudwara in California in 1915. This marked the beginning of religious vibrancy of the Indian diasporics in the US. ISKCON, which has also been established, has gained immense following. Sections of the US Indian diaspora have also been responsive to the ideology of Hindutva and have engaged in various aspects of it. There have been varied temples which have been established and which serve as a focal point for family engagement and religious and cultural preservation. Certain temples also have language classes and translate scripts. However, the very infamous 11 September 2001 attack on the World Trade Center has curbed the freedom of Indians and 
Indians had to face a great deal of discrimination. Sikhs especially have become targets as their turbans have been associated with the Osama bin Laden image. Dressing has also become an issue for the Muslims with their veils being questioned. Florida state's ruling that the full face needs to be seen on a licensed photo is seen as a major infringement upon the First Amendment which grants right to the exercise of religion without restraint. This point of view has also been upheld through articles in the press that have attempted to contrast Western to North and Western beliefs and cultural practices. Over and above religious violence and stigma, a pressing concern is that of dual identities of the second generation Indian immigrants. They call themselves Indian Americans. Home thus becomes a focal point for preserving religious and cultural identity with religious art occupying a prime place in most homes because parents feel that that is the only way they could introduce their children to Indianness. Another important place in which Indians have contributed in the US and have been doing so consistently is political participation of the Indian diaspora. The Indian community has attempted to participate in the US political life by organizing various campaigns and forming organizations. This action has been supported by the US Constitution. Before 1965, such organizations were an attempt to preserve the cultural heritage rather than engaging in political participation. Organizations like the Gujarati Association, the Telugu Association have all been a fallout of racial attacks. In California in 1966, things changed when Dilip Singh Saud became the first Indian origin member to be elected to the US Congress. Indians have since then attempted to influence the electoral process through fundraising and creation of groups to support candidates. They have also participated in elections through voting. This has resulted in them being elected to various posts. Bobby Jindal was a candidate for the governor's post in Louisiana in 2004 and in 2012 elections, Dr. Amira Bera became the third Indian American to be elected to the Congress. Let us now consider Indians' contribution to American literature. Indian American literature is very popular and tries to capture the dynamics of multiple identities, resistance and negotiation while integrating into the mainstream. It has produced many famous writers covering diverse genres and constitutes a contribution of the Indian immigrants to the US life. Over and above the contribution to literature, there is also a socio-cultural integration pattern among Indian immigrants in the US. There is an attempt to project Indian culture as rooted and timeless as against the open American culture. So too, Indians are culturally seen to prefer professions like doctors, engineers and computer professionals. This has however made choice difficult for second generation Indian Americans who might want to try something new. Attempts at preserving Indian culture have been many, with Indian origin parents forbidding children to date before marriage, engage in premarital sex, etc., labeling it as against Indian culture. Moreover, many young girls are tutored in Indian dance with academies offering classes in varied classical and popular dance forms. Varied Indian songs and skits become a part of cultural celebrations, including Indian Republic Day parades. Remix has become the second generation's attempt to mediate between the two cultures. Interestingly, Indian student unions are formed on campuses to encourage dating between Indian boys and girls. Furthermore, there is a celebration of varied Indian festivals. However, it is important to remember that Indians are seen to acculturate but don't easily assimilate, especially the Sikh immigrants. Let us now turn towards language politics. Offsetting the linguistic diversity in the US is the loss of native languages given the preference of the Indian diaspora for using English. This can be seen in the fact that young Indians have regularly won the spelling bee context. This inclining towards English has served as an advantage in integrating with the mainstream. By way of conclusion, it is important to remember that there is a wide variance in the integration based on caste, religion, 
occupation, gender, and many other factors. There is also an attempt to integrate on diverse areas which may not always be successful. This integration is affected by the policies of the host country. However, the positives are that the second generation is attempting to change it and there is a difference in the mainstream culture by the substreams as much as there is an attempt to assimilate. Therefore, the story of integration is a two-way process in both US and Canada. Thank you.